This is Dr. Nick Rizzo from ringsidemedicine.com with the referee's evaluation of the knockdown fighter. The original referee's evaluation was developed and presented by Dr. Dominic Coletta, Dr. Paul Wallace, and Dr. Larry Lovelace of the Association of Ringside Physicians and was titled the two-step 12-second mini neuro evaluation of the knockdown fighter. Over the past few years, it has been presented to several boxing organizations, including the ARP, the WBC, and several state commissions. I wish to acknowledge their work in developing this exam in addition to their dedication to ringside medicine. This specific referee's evaluation was recently presented to a group of referees and commission members, and the questions and comments from that session, in addition to points from those credited here, were used to expand it into its present form. Additions in this presentation also include signs of concussion, handling the knocked out fighter, referee doctor communication, and others. I would also like to thank Dr. Dominic Coletta of the ARP, Dr. Larry Lovelace, ARP President, ABC Medical Committee and Chief Ringside Physician for Oklahoma, Dr. Don Mutzi of the Minnesota Athletic Commission, the ARP and the ABC Medical Committee, and the members of the Illinois Commission for their attention and contribution to this presentation. Of course, I have to say this presentation does not represent any official opinion or recommendation of the aforementioned organizations or individuals. The purpose of developing a standardized, medically sound referee's evaluation is twofold. First, to have a mini neuro exam completed in a rapid fashion so as to have a clear assessment of the knockdown fighter. Second, to not deprive the fighter's opponent of any advantage he or she has gained from having knocked the other fighter down. A bit more explanation about this lecture is needed. The lecture is about 24 minutes long. Some may think it's a bit complex, but it's really not so much as it seems. Rather, each step is broken down into detail. This lecture is designed to be viewed on video, so someone can pause and go over each step if they want, and end up with a thorough understanding of what they're doing each step of the way. Keep in mind that this referee's evaluation is designed to help the referee determine if a fighter can continue. It is designed to answer specific questions for the referee in a particular circumstance, and that is why there are several steps broken down here. When performed in the ring or cage, the entire protocol should flow smoothly and should take less than 12 seconds. So who is this lecture for? It's not only for the referees, but it's also for the fighters. If a fighter is familiar with what will be expected of him or her, they can more accurately and efficiently perform their role. More importantly, when there is an accepted protocol in place and everyone follows it, then there can be no questions. In other words, no one can fault you for things when you followed the rules. The referee's evaluation of the knockdown fighter begins long before the actual bout. It's very important to know your fighters and to be able to identify their corners and translators in case of issues, especially if they are entering the ring also. In addition, the pre-event talk is a time to establish your role for the rest of the evening. One point I like to teach is the difference between the words friend and buddy. A friend will tell you the truth regardless of whether you want to hear it or not, and a buddy will tell you what you want to hear regardless of if it's good advice or not. Here, you are the fighter's friend, but you are not their buddy. In other words, you are their advocate, and at times advocating for them by protecting them from themselves. Part of what we do during the pre-event talk is identify the corners and trainers and establish common commands, especially if there are language barriers. Additionally, this is a unique opportunity to instruct the fighters on what happens during the referee's evaluation. This is, after all, the Can a Fighter Continue test. The five parts of this test are to stand, eye contact, feet together, gloves up okay, follow, and continue. Having gone through this during the pre-event talk eliminates any excuses on the part of the fighter during the bout, in addition to creating a more professional experience all around. Talk to your doctor. Before the bout, talk to and get to know the ringside doctors. There's usually more than one, and one of them is usually designated as the senior physician for the event. Go over specific protocols regarding injured fighters. Go over expectations. For example, making eye contact with the doctors between rounds, etc. Also, know where ringside doctors and paramedics will be sitting in case you need to emergently flag them into the ring. One of the main things you need to assess before a knockdown happens is knowing whether a fighter is in trouble for a variety of reasons. For example, is a fighter simply outclassed? Did the fighter cut too much weight? Is he showing signs of dehydration or possibly even heat illness or heat exhaustion? Anything look funny at all which would indicate problems with other medical conditions? Does he have a concussion? Let's focus on this last one a bit more here. Going over signs of concussion. Headache is the most common symptom of concussion, but there's a catch with professional fighters. Given that the adrenaline rush is so high during combat arts events, fighters are often not able to perceive headaches as they normally would otherwise when they're in a fight. 
This is very similar to how they can take a punch and not have the same reaction to the pain that they would otherwise feel if they were not in an actual bout. So this means that if a fighter says he has a headache, it has to be taken very seriously. Other signs you want to look for are dizziness and decreased balance, a disoriented fighter that doesn't seem to know where he is yet, and of course any loss of consciousness. It's important to note that loss of consciousness occurs in less than 10% of patients in general. And I'm referring to the general population here, not necessarily fighters. But the statistic does drive home the idea that most concussions occur without a loss of consciousness. Again, you want to look for confusion, disorientation, or slowed response. If you look at this slide, for example, the fighter obviously has a response slow enough to not get up during the count as exhibited here. He's not looking at the ref, and he's disoriented and probably confused. So how does this look during a bout? There are several things that you can see here. When you translate the signs of concussion into the context of a bout, you're going to look for dropped arms, decreased footwork, a lack of following, decreased response time, that deer in the headlights look, a fighter that's not himself or herself, and sometimes not being able to control their own mouthpiece. In the event of a knockdown, ask yourself what happened. Was there a loss of consciousness? If so, then the bout is over. In other words, is it a knockout or a knockdown? One way to look at it is that most knockouts can be described as a knockdown with a loss of consciousness. If there was no loss of consciousness, then you go on to ask yourself other questions. Was there a neck injury? Was there a non-injury reason for a fall like a slip? Was there a headbutt? If you are unsure what happened with a knockdown fighter, then don't hesitate to go on to do the referee's evaluation. One key point here is that as a referee, you can view a knockdown as a unique opportunity. Also, a knockdown is your chance to evaluate for futility. If the fighter is really outclassed, or if you should stop the fight for other reasons, this is an excellent time to take a pause in the action and evaluate. Here's another clear way to think of things. A knockdown results in one of three situations. The first scenario is a loss of consciousness. If there's any loss of consciousness whatsoever, even for one second, the bout is over. The second case is a non-injury cause, for example, a slip. And then you can clearly resume the fight according to the rules and regulations. The third scenario is when there is a knockdown and you need to evaluate the fighter to be sure there was no loss of consciousness and if the fighter is able to continue. In other words, you need to do the referee's evaluation. In the first scenario, loss of consciousness, one of the key things that has to be a basic understanding both for the referee and the commission personnel is that any loss of consciousness whatsoever equals a knockout. The bout is over and there are really no exceptions to this. If you see a fighter has lost consciousness, you should end the fight then and there. You do not need to keep counting. Don't be this guy and keep counting just for the sake of the count, especially when there's pressure on a big event. If a loss of consciousness occurs, the bout is over and you can stop the count. And remember, this applies to all causes, including vascular chokes and MMA, etc. Loss of consciousness can occur at any time. This includes after the bell between rounds. If a fighter gets rocked and goes back to his corner, for example, and loses consciousness transiently even in the corner, the bout is considered over. The other thing to be aware of is the flash knockout. A flash knockout is the loss of consciousness that is very transient. It may only be for half a second or one or two seconds. It may mimic a fighter just getting rocked, but it still counts as a loss of consciousness and a knockout. One of the problems to be aware of with flash knockouts is that knockouts are amnestic. What that means is that a fighter may not remember he was knocked out. He has a brief episode of amnesia regarding the hit that knocked him out. He often doesn't know that he even got hit because a few seconds prior to the knockout was essentially erased from his brain. One common scenario with flash knockouts is when a fighter gets hit, he starts to crumble to the canvas and then comes around before he's completely to the ground and then stands up ready to continue fighting, never having fully crumbled to the canvas. Again, I want to reiterate here that a fighter can have trouble in between rounds and lose consciousness in between rounds or display other injuries in between rounds. So the referee can actually disqualify the fighter or call a knockout or TKO or whatever the situation need be in between rounds. It doesn't have to be during the actual bout. What's more, there can be other causes for loss of consciousness. For example, the head can hit other things aside from a punch. A fighter can bang their head on the floor, the apron, the canvas, or even a turnbuckle. There can also be problems from before the fight, such as previous sparring injuries earlier in the week, and other medical issues such as dehydration, undeclared sickle cell disease, illegal substances, or even delayed responses from chokes. 
You can see in the left-hand picture the fighter is getting hit from the front and his head then bounces off the turnbuckle. In the picture to the right, the fighter's head is actually hitting the table on the outside of the ring. Here's a picture of a potential C-spine injury. This fighter was actually okay, but there have been injuries similar to this where a head would snap over a rope and cause a very serious neck injury. Again, remember that loss of consciousness from a concussion is usually amnestic, and especially if it's a flash or transient loss of consciousness, a fighter will think that he's continuing to fight when he comes around. The fighter may even argue your decision to stop the bout. So how do you know there's truly a loss of consciousness? Sometimes a fighter's eyes will stay closed or even stay open, but they certainly do not track or follow you. The fighter is unable to follow commands. The fighter can go flaccid or limp, so obviously look for a loss of control. Keep in mind, as in this picture here, just because a fighter's eyes are open does not mean that they are not knocked out. And when the fighter comes around, they are usually pretty disoriented, even if only for a few seconds. Of course, the longer you are around in this business, the more recognizable this becomes. When attending to a downed fighter, remember to protect the fighter and yourself. There's something called emergence aggression. Because the fighters don't remember being knocked out when they come around, they often think they're still fighting. So if you look at this picture, this referee is doing an excellent job of keeping the fighter on the ground stabilized until he was fully oriented, but yet his own head is lifted upward and away from potential swings. Protect yourself. Don't get hit by a confused fighter. If a downed fighter is slow to get up, or is having difficulty getting up, if he has lost consciousness or disoriented, then don't let them get up. They are certainly a high risk for falling, recurring injury, and they may stand up swinging. In other words, a fighter must be okay and oriented before you let them stand up. If these things occur to a significant degree, then the referee should keep the fighter down until the physician gets to them. If they do get up of their own, despite our best efforts, then we can direct him to sit on a stool near his corner men, etc. Here's another important point. Don't move the neck. Fighters are considered to have a C-spine injury that is a neck injury until proven otherwise and cleared by the medical team. Absolutely don't try and slap the fighter or move the head or neck trying to get them to come back around. Slapping a fighter does not reduce or change the time needed for them to come around and it can make a non-visible injury much worse. Don't worry about the mouthpiece. Sometimes a fighter will just spit it out of his own accord. At the other end of the spectrum, custom mouthpieces can be very difficult to remove. Only remove it if it's causing an obvious problem. While we are on the subject of mouthpieces, it's important to know about something called a convulsive concussion. They are not common, but a convulsive concussion is a type of concussion where a knocked out person appears to have a seizure or seizure-like activity. They can have parts of their body go flaccid, and other parts move back and forth like a seizure. This may also include facial contractions and grimacing. It often lasts on the order of a few seconds and sometimes up to a minute or so. It's usually advisable to not touch the mouthpiece here and definitely do not put your fingers in the fighter's mouth. Stay next to the fighter until the medical team takes over. Sometimes even the downed fighter's opponent can cause trouble, even with good intentions, by coming over and trying to shake the hand or hug or congratulate a downed fighter. Don't let them interfere until the fighter is cleared and stable. Protect the fighter from post-bout chaos. If it's a big fight or it ends in a dramatic fashion, people can flood the ring and certainly cause problems for control. Here's an important and quick point. If a fighter is unconscious for one minute or more, then it's a general rule that they get transported to the hospital via ambulance, even if they clear and look fine. This rule applies for any of the reasons for a loss of consciousness, like a knockout, a choke, dehydration, etc. Here's just a quick word about the non-injury fall. Be sure they are not injured during the fall, even if it's occurred for reasons not having to do with the bout or opponent contact per se. Non-injury falls are pretty straightforward otherwise, but just be sure something weird didn't happen. In the third situation, what if you're unsure if the fighter was concussed or if they can continue? It's key to remember that the purpose of the referee's evaluation is to test the fighter for signs of a concussion or other causes for them that would not allow them to continue. It is, in essence, a brief neurologic exam. Additionally, this is an opportunity to address, according to your sport, boxing, MMA, or kickboxing, and according to your jurisdiction's rules, if a standing eight count is appropriate or if a three knockdown rule applies. Additionally, though, this is another chance to assess for futility. Now we come to the key part of this presentation, what makes up the referee's evaluation. It consists of five parts. But before even beginning this evaluation, you must be sure, again, there was no loss of consciousness. Then, first, the fighter has to stand of their own accord. Second, they have to make eye contact. Third, you ask the fighter to put their feet together and their gloves up and ask him if they are okay. 
Fourth, they have to follow you two steps forward and then two steps to either side. Fifth, of course, you ask a fighter if they want to continue. We'll go through these in a bit more detail in the following slides. Now, at first glance, this may seem like a lot, but in essence, it's all done rather simultaneously and should take no more than 12 seconds. Of course, if a fighter cannot complete this evaluation inside of 12 seconds, then you can feel free to consider it a failed evaluation and you have grounds to stop the bout. Again, if there's any loss of consciousness, the bout is over. If any of the numbers 1 through 4 don't pass, then if doing a standing 8 count, keep counting, or the bout is immediately over at the referee's discretion. Keep in mind the fighter must pass all five parts of this evaluation and want to continue. The fighter must be able to stand and stand unassisted of their own accord. As the referee, you are allowed to tell them to stand or command them to stand up, but you can't assist them to stand up. They have to be standing without supporting themselves from any other structure like the ropes or cage. Eye contact. What this means is assessing to see that they can focus and communicate and pay attention. The key here is that a fighter must maintain eye contact with the referee. If a fighter is slow to make eye contact, point to your own eyes, indicating to look into your eyes, as a signal to get their attention. Number three, feet together, gloves up, and okay. Note that this is a clear command from the referee. Say to the fighter, feet together, gloves up. The fighter has to maintain this stance for a second or two, doing this focused, with feet together and gloves up is an important part of the exam. If his gloves drop or drift, or if he loses his balance, you have the right to stop the bout. During this one or two seconds, ask the fighter, you okay? Asking the fighter if they were okay gives you a second or two to evaluate their balance and ability to hold their gloves up. Given the noise of a venue and possible language barriers, it's good to direct things with clear hand motions, not unlike a traffic cop. Start with both hands, fingers extended at eye or shoulder level, and quickly move your hands into this position. This gives an action that is a nonverbal cue to the fighter to focus and pay attention to your commands. You do not need to hold your hands up or keep them there. What you're doing is just starting your motion of pointing to their feet so the fighter can clearly see what you are doing. In other words, it allows the fighter to recognize that you are giving directions with your hands. Then immediately motion them downwards to point at the fighter's feet, directing their attention there. Then bring your hands together, saying, feet together. Then make your hands into fists, raised at just above waist level, giving the fighter direction to raise his gloves. Immediately flatten your hands, palm down, so the fighter can raise his gloves into your hands. The fighter is to raise their gloves and keep them there. This process may seem like a lot, but when done clearly, directly, and quickly, again, it takes only a few seconds. Here's a quick tip. To help quickly illustrate your command to the fighter when you motion your hands to indicate feet together, move your own feet together at the same time. Don't lift the gloves up for the fighter. If you notice in the diagram, the referee's hand is extended palm down, and the fighter has to lift their gloves up into the referee's hand. Let's take a closer look and break down what feet together, gloves up, are you okay really is. What you are doing here is actually taking a quick mental pause and looking for three things. First, is the fighter following your commands? Second, can the fighter maintain his stance and balance? And third, can they hold their arms up and not have them drift downwards? This step is actually a simplified combination of a few neurologic tests that doctors often do. This slide goes into a bit more detail than you need to know, but you can come back to this part of the video if you are curious. Again, feet together, gloves up, okay, combines these two tests called Romberg pronator drift, but it is a simplified version of them, so a referee can do it in a simple fashion, and quickly at that. Again, at first glance it seems too complex to do in the ring, but it's really very simple and boils down to just looking for a few things. So after the fighter puts his feet together and raises his gloves, you have to quickly look for two things. The first is balance. Be sure the fighter is not swaying side to side or swaying front to back. The second thing is dropping the arms. Now, this picture here is a medical illustration which shows the actual medical test, and as you can see, the left arm is dropping or drifting downwards. It'll often do so in a gradual fashion. In the ring, a fighter will drop his arm in the same way. You are actually doing three things at the same time, directing the fighter, demonstrating feet gloves for the fighter, and watching the fighter. So in other words, when you're done motioning with your hands, you will have actually adopted the feet together gloves up stance yourself and held it for a second while you observe the fighter's ability to do the same. Ask the fighter, you okay? This simple phrase is easily understood in nearly all languages. This is done immediately after they are maintaining eye contact in the feet and gloves stance. Asking this question also allows you a second or two to observe how they are doing in the feet and gloves stance. Here's a tip. Do not acknowledge their answer to, you okay. 
If you do, they will think the exam is over and move towards the center of the ring to start fighting again. Save this acknowledgement for the end of the evaluation. What if they are not okay? This is your chance to be aware of problems getting worse or new problems showing up. If needed, call a timeout here or, if the fighter is failing the evaluation, even end the bout. Number four, follow. Fighters must move forward directed by the referee two steps. In other words, the referee moves back two steps. Then the fighter is directed to move two steps to the side. Keep in mind that during this direction, you don't want to have your hands on top of the gloves, effectively acting to lead the fighter. To start this command, make a motion with one hand for the fighter to come towards you. Then motion for, to the fighter to move two steps to either side, left or right. Also, while giving these demands, be sure to clearly take two steps backwards yourself and then two steps to the left or two steps to the right. This is simply an overhead view of a referee taking two steps back and two steps to one side. Doing a rumba with your feet while trying to direct a fighter doesn't usually work that well, but demonstrating does. Ask the fighter if they want to continue. Even if they pass the evaluation, they may not want to continue for another reason. For example, a fighter with a broken hand or severe headache could pass this evaluation up until this point. It also gives a fighter a second chance to withdraw from the bout, this time with a bit clearer head. So in reviewing, the steps are, ask yourself, was there a loss of consciousness? If not, go on to the other questions. Can the fighter stand? Ask the fighter to stand, feet together, gloves up, and if they're okay, and then to follow. If they pass all of these four, then ask the fighter if he can continue. Here are the commands in Spanish. Now here's another key point. It's important to go through these commands, in fact, go through the entire five-step process with the fighters at the pre-event talk. That way, they are familiar with the commands and are familiar with what's expected of them. Additionally, if they are clearly instructed beforehand, they can have no excuses for not following them during the bout. What if, after all of this, you're still not sure? Well, then you have a lifeline. If you're unsure at this point, call the doctor to help evaluate the fighter. Remember to use the doctor throughout the fight. Communicate with, look at the doctor throughout the fight, make eye contact in between rounds, and communicate with the doctor between rounds if needed. Call timeout for medical evaluation if needed. The last point is, of course, to always look at the winner. One mistake we often make is that we assume that if a fighter wins, that he's not hurt. But of course, this is best characterized by the phrase, you should have seen the other guy. I sincerely hope that you found this lecture helpful. Again, I would like to thank Drs. Coletta, Wallace, Lovelace, and Mutsi in addition to the Illinois Commission. Thank you for watching this presentation.